Good morning, everyone. I uh, just would like to welcome you to uh, the Sports and Performing Arts Rehabilitation Health uh, Grand Rounds this morning with Dr. Uh, Jatin Amagawankar. Uh, Dr. Amagawankar is uh, currently at George Mason University um, in just outside of DC. Um, and we're really pleased to have him here today. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing uh, Dr. Amagawankar for um, well, many years now, um, going back to the days when he was doing uh, his graduate work, um, uh, doing some postgraduate work down um, mm -hmm. at Old University. And uh, Dr. Amgawankar uh, got his PhD in, in uh, athletic training from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. Um, he has a master's of science in sports injury prevention and management from Springfield College. Um, and has his bachelor's in occupational therapy uh, from the University of Mumbai. Um, currently, uh, his work is um, in many different areas regarding performing arts and performing arts health, um, as he is faculty in teaching athletic training. Um, he has an, an overall uh, research vision that looks at healthcare across the lifespan. Uh, so working with older adults in community engaged arts programs, um, looking at preventative screenings and epidemiological methods um, to find ways uh, to improve uh, the health and reduce risk in uh, performing arts uh, and, and performing uh, artist athletes. Um, in children, he's working with biosensors and uh, in the smart lab that he has there, uh, which I've had a privilege to, to visit. And it's uh, a most impressive uh, clinical biomechanics lab looking at how physical activity can positively address childhood obesity. Um, so uh, with that, I'm, I'm really excited to hear your talk today, uh, Jatin, and uh, I'll turn things over to you. Um, thank you to Dennis Rivenberg and to uh, Dr. John Wilkins for co-chairing this event. And uh, it is my privilege today uh, to turn things over to you. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Ken, for that introduction. I know there were a couple of slides in my presentation at the start, uh, and I'm just looking for screen access, I think, uh, to share my presentation. I think, uh, I think Dennis, you might have to give that to me. Uh, it says at this point it's disabled. So, okay, there you go. Okay, so thank you again, Ken. Thank you. Uh, it, it's it's good to see some some colleagues and friends from performing arts medicine. Uh, I just saw an alum of ours uh, uh, who's at Navy right now. So uh, it's a privilege and an honor to be here again. Uh, Ken seen me grow through, I guess, the academy and uh, uh, what I have done. Hopefully, over the last 15, 20 years. Uh, I'll probably talk about that uh, with the with the crux being the translation of the research from practice to from research to practice uh, via community engagement. Uh, no financial disclosure slide, uh, and uh, hopefully we we'll, I'll talk about how I have tried to do this across the lifespan. Again, can thank you for that introduction. Uh, to show what we have been up to and where we are headed at George Mason and the Smart Lab in the near future. So again, a few things about me, as Ken said, my bachelor's in occupational therapy, where I worked uh, within at the Paraplegic Foundation in India uh, for a little bit. And I came to Springfield College for my master's in athletic training, sports medicine, injury prevention management, uh, went down then to North Carolina at Greensboro for my doctoral work, which is where I started working with performing artist athletes and developed a program for them um, and got interested into that line of work and haven't looked back in that sense since that point in time. Uh, and then being at George Mason University, um, again, outside of DC in Fairfax, uh, Manassas area, for about 17 years now and uh, uh, work in the athletic training program uh, and the kinesiology program uh, with, with master's, bachelor's and doctoral level 
students uh, within the purview of our lab uh, from a research perspective. So uh, my vision again for this talk, I'm going to concentrate on this idea of health for arts, artists and athletes and using physical activity uh, and arts for health. So the confluence of how that would work and how that is working for us and what I've tried to do. So the approach that we take for this kind of work is really start looking at a practitioner, a uh, healthcare provider and a participant, the confluence of how that works together. Because I think uh, we are recognizing for the community to be part of what you do. The community has to be empowered to be a part of what you do. Um, the, the, the planning of the projects, the planning of the work, the planning of the outcomes, the testing, the research, all of that has to uh, engage and uh, uh, work with the community, which has again been a slight but gentle mind shift for us in the lab. And hopefully uh, I'll show some examples of how we have tried to do this and how we will be working on that. So uh, our, our theoretical model that we try to use in the lab is some of us may have heard about the TRIP model, the translating research injury into practice and prevention model, which starts at that 12 o'clock part there, where you examine the problem. Uh, if there is a problem, identify the gap in the work, identify the causes, develop a plan or an implementation or epidemiologically just, to, just see what's going on, examine the context, implement the plan on, assess. And as a, as a world society, unfortunately, uh, COVID has, has shown us what this looks like in a very, very, very rapid fashion and how we as a society have gone through this circle and keep going through this loop. Uh, I think uh, all of us have become up front and center uh, with how they're working and you know, work at George Hopkins. Uh, several of you probably are working with multiple groups in that perspective, uh, but that's what we designed. Every project has a component of all of this. Uh, and can reflexively change. So what we will also talk about is the different types of research we, do, we have done from a methodological perspective. So you will see some of the work that we have done has been primarily quantitative with just assessment of data. We've looked at some preventative information. We've looked at some correlation designs. We've looked at some uh, randomized controlled trial designs. We've looked at quantitative work. We've looked at qualitative work. So I think uh, uh, what I they want to talk about a little bit is when we talk about research and oftentimes students, when they think about research, they think about the lab being the only place for the research. And now what we are trying to talk about is that the research and scholarship is a intellectual enterprise uh, where yes, there can be lab work that can be done and should be done, but that's not the only place. Yes, the clinic can be the place where you do the work, but it's also important for us to go to our patients where they exist, our participants where they live and how we work within their setting. So hopefully we will try and talk about that uh, and, and give you some snippets of the work that I have done uh, to get that perspective out. So as uh, Ken talked about, I'll, I'll briefly talk about how we are using performing arts health and health for performing artists across the lifespan. So we'll go across the lifespan. We start with children, do a little bit of a tour about some of the work there, look at a little bit with our share of the Supporting Healthy Arts Research Consortium, where we look at uh, adult uh, performing artists and then uh, in, in the older adults, how we are using uh, arts and uh, dance, performing arts medicine as a modality uh, to improve multiple uh, biopsychosocial outcomes. So let's start uh, with, the, with, the, with the young ones. Uh, and so this is a project that we've started working with our local public school system, the Prince William County school system. And here, what we started to think about the gap in the area and all of us are living in society uh, where we know this is a problem. We know that our children, uh, as they grow up, a third of them are either overweight or obese. And when children grow uh, adult towards their adolescent phase, 
about 75% of adolescent don't really meet the aerobic physical activity guidelines that have been set forth by the CDC and uh, the NHANES survey, which again, some of us may have heard about it. Uh, the NSS, the survey disdained American youth uh, to earn really not a good grade on the category of overall physical activity. And we see a beautiful, well, I shouldn't say beautiful, it looks beautiful on screen, but it's probably uh, not very healthy. There is a clear dip uh, of overall physical activity as children grow from the single digits to the double digits. So nine, 10 years old after that, there is a big dip in, in what they move. And this dip is further more pronounced in uh, females as compared to males. So girls as compared to males. And so the CDC has put out guidelines and uh, we've heard about this. Some of us have played with this. Some of us live this uh, in terms of looking at physical activity and the CDC suggests that children should be doing at least 60 minutes of physical activity daily. And the recommendations suggest that preferably 30 minutes of those should be in school uh, and then the remainder can be outside of school. And when we think about children who are from low income families who may not have the resources to enroll kids after school, in physical activity programs or clubs or sport activities, school oftentimes become the place where these kids had the ability and the opportunity to engage in the physical activity. And PE classes uh, oftentimes offer different physical activity modes and may be a great way to gently nudge these students to first physically stay and remain active. So that's the problem we were trying to address. Uh, and so we uh, looked at PE classes. Uh, there, each of the PE classes were scheduled on a three day, every three day uh, uh, curriculum basis, approximately 90 minutes per across the semester. And we used uh, this uh, culturally appropriate ballroom dance form. So we were in a uh, middle school where 51% of the children were low or reduced income and a primarily uh, Latino background. And so we use uh, appropriate dance forms, especially this was interesting because this we learned when we are starting to work with them uh, in a large part of the Hispanic community, there's the rite of passage, uh, uh, quinceanera where there is a requirement, well, social requirement in some way, shape or form of the students, children uh, to start performing a, a, a dance part of the celebration as they, as they uh, go from the threshold into becoming adults. And so this was a great place where the students wanted to learn in the middle school area uh, and participate. So again, using activity that they would want to do, they would have liked to do. So we use some biosensors and you may have seen some of these in the older polar heart rate monitors, but these are, uh, uh, we have these called the Zephyr. Uh, and again, these go around the chest. Uh, at the bottom right, you can see it, it has a lot of data that the system can provide, including heart rate and posture and pressures and a lot of different information, GPS uh, located, but we put primarily in this project, looking at the moderate to vigorous physical activity as a percentage of heart rate. So that was the uh, lab part in from a terms of biosensor perspective. And then, as I said, we also used a, a participant led survey questionnaire called the PACES questionnaire, which is a, an acronym for the physical activity enjoyment scale, because the research really suggests Research says, right? Research says that uh, if you engage and all of us do that, if we really enjoy an activity, we are going to try to stick with it. So we try to figure out which activity or how much enjoyment, excuse me, participants would be having. And so, as you can see, it goes from a five point Likert scale. I disagree completely to agree strongly. And there are several questions uh, that we ask participants. 
And so what we really found after our analysis is that uh, there was a pretty good amount of physical activity during class. And again, this is a big, quick summary. What you're seeing in that pie chart on the right-hand side is very light, light, moderate, moderate to vigorous and near maximal activity. And that last group is where we are interested. The MVPA is what is suggested in the literature. The, that's the one that makes you uh, uh, heart pound, make you cannot speak well, which means you're really working your cardiovascular system. And that's supposed to elicit uh, positive cardiovascular responses and health benefits. So what we did find was about 36.6% of the class time uh, the participants were engaged in this form. And this translated to around that 30 minute threshold that we were talking about earlier, about what participants should be doing. And from a paces perspective, it was rated to be enjoyable. The participants really found that activity to be enjoyable. So this was really good for us to see as a start project that yes, dance performing can as a performing arts can actually as a part of physical activity uh, produce some positive high volume high intensity kind of responses then our next project we took that a, a step further and again we got some funding from our local novant hospital foundation uh, where we now said okay we know this works in children in dance let's try to compare some different modalities and how that works. And now instead of using a, a biosensor, we, we use another, for the Zephyr, we use another biosensor called the Actigraph. And some of you may have seen this. And this is, if you can see, it is a wristwatch. We can wear it on the wrist. You can wear it on the ankle. We use the wrist version. And it is a research gate Fitbit or an Apple watch, if you, uh, if you can call it that, with some other capabilities. Uh, and so the project similarly, uh, but this time, as we said, we added different types of activity, again, PE classes. So there were group sports, which was, for example, soccer, individual sport, for example, tennis, our social activity, which we define again as the dance activity, and then the basic skills of fitness that the participants did in their regular classrooms during PE. And so similar data analysis, data collection, uh, we primarily then found that again, we see on the, on the left set of bars, MVPA, the middle is the light, and the, on the right, you see the sedentary, and we were most interested in the MVP. And again, the results were very, very consistent in that about 30%. 35% of the time participants were engaged in physical activity from a statistical perspective, the group activity, the soccer team activity was a little bit higher than all the other activities. And we attributed that to the competitive nature because these were the only activities in which the participants were asked to play games or scrimmages during practice, which we thought asked them to do a little bit more than take part in movement. Uh, but for our purposes, we were pleased again to see that the percentages of MVPA were right there with all different forms of physical activity. And so what does this really mean for us? Well, it means for us that at least in this age group, dance as a form of physical activity is fun and a logical and relatively accepting way for them as children to stay active and become active. Uh, really doesn't require a whole lot of equipment. Uh, we oftentimes saw that the participants were most of the girls, some of the boys, but most of the girls were engaged in, in this activity. They had fun. There were, there were smiles in the room. Uh, and uh, we really think that this is a way so to address posit positively the obesity epidemic uh, in the youth population. And so many are working with the county system to figure out how we can use this information to make sure that dance becomes a consistent form across all PE program that because at this point it doesn't it depends on the instructor uh, and so we are trying to ensure that as children are exposed to dance hopefully as as they grow it stays part of their life not every day but as a regular part of their physical activity regimen as they grow up. So uh, that's just a quick snapshot of what we did with the younger uh, population. 
uh, with regards to adults, I said, uh, as I said, we started at George Mason, our SHARE consortium, which again stands for supporting healthy arts research and the and the, and the uh, basic crux of this consortium is really across different universities. We are trying to improve the health of the performing artists. And at the bottom, you are seeing some of the collaborators and colleagues that we work with across the nation. And so um, uh, at Mason, we are the repository and we, we, provide, uh, we provide the basic structure for all of our partners to uh, do some data collection. We are looking at exposure data. We are looking at health data from a variety of angles. Uh, and again, the problem that we talk about here or the issue or the gap we are talking about is we're really talking about a large population in the adults, younger adult group who take part in physical activity. Uh, some of us enjoy where you think, so you think you can dance, dancing with the stars that have become popular competitive dance, uh, collegiate level dance, social dance, right? So we have about 10 million students who in the nation, in the US alone, uh, uh, perform physical activity, dance activity at least two to three times a week. So they define themselves as such, uh, about half a million of, of the population defines themselves as being employed. Uh, as teachers, there are 400 colleges and universities which offer higher education programs and Peabody at, at uh, Hopkins is one of the premier organizations that does that and about 75,000 professionals uh, and when we're talking about performing arts, I mean not just dance, we are talking about everybody that performs physical activity that could include theater, that could include Cirque de Soleil, that could include music, so anywhere where they are physically moving, right? So we're not talking about painting art, we're talking about performance, uh, where there is an aesthetic component associated with the activity. And so from a research perspective, from an epidemiological perspective, we know that about 80% of dancers uh, enjoyed every season, right? So which is very close to the athletic, so artistic, athletic artist, 80% uh, of dancers get injured, about 65% from a chronic uh, mechanism, about 35 from an acute mechanism, and a large chunk of the problems occur in the lower body, uh, lower body injuries. So that's the problem that we know a large group participates in these activities, a large group does uh, get injured. Uh, and so when we talk about a healthy performing artist, we are now again becoming broader with our definition and again yeah, it's just not the physical the physical is a big part the musculoskeletal cardiovascular and other perspective but there is also a mental part um, there is also an emotional part there is also a spiritual part so all of these combine and not just for performing artists for us right us as humans uh, we are recognized that health is much more than just physical well-being. It's mental, social, spiritual, all of these above. So again, we are starting to work with the community and I'll again give some examples of how we are trying to address some of these aspects together because really health is a multidimensional thing. Uh, and we primarily started, my training primarily was in the physical musculoskeletal, physical medicine rehab perspective, but uh, we are recognizing and we know that we need to do more in the psychosocial perspective to help our participants, patients live healthier lives overall. So again, we've devised multiple projects. I'll just give one example of a project. We are doing a combination of clinician reported outcomes or CROs. So we look at physical fitness screenings. We look at dance exposures, injuries. Uh, and then we look at participant reported outcomes. So they could include self-reported surveys, self-reported uh, health related quality of life. And Raj, uh, Dr. Deo and I have worked on, on, on some work uh, with a student who did some of this work with the overarching idea to really reduce injury and enhance performing from athletic training, physical activity, uh, physical therapy perspective. So, I'm just going to 
take 10 seconds for you to just look at some of the work that we um, we have done in the recent past but i'm not i'm going to i'm going to highlight a couple of pieces and i'm glad to talk if we have the time later for other things but we've looked at fitness as injury we've looked at supplemental or cross training uh, we've looked at periodization of nutrition how do you periodize nutrition pre during post we've looked at quality of life we've looked at literacy health literacy how much do our patients know how much do our patients need to know we've looked at some biomechanical work we've looked at some footwear uh, work so quickly what is some of the research telling us right so when we talk about evidence for injury risk uh, some of us may have known or know about this test called the star excursion balance test and what you can see on the right hand side is the dancer trying to do this test uh, and we have kind of it started as a star pattern that you put on the ground and the participants uh, stand at the center point of that star and reach out as far as they can with the other leg without losing balance and come back to the center point again without losing balance after tapping the furthest most point and there are multiple variations of this that exist in the literature now so there is a y balance test which has reduced all these eight directions and has become a inverted y shape so front posterior medial and posterior lateral being the three directions uh, that participants do now. And now even furthermore with some modeling literature, uh, it's becoming clear that even the star balance test, which was they reused down to the Y balance test can potentially for expediency of time and effort can be reduced to a single leg anterior reach test. So just the anterior direction that's what the research is suggesting might be enough because there may be redundancies in what the other directions tell us. Uh, but clearly there has been several pieces of work that have suggested that this test can show us as a practitioner or provider uh, who is potentially, potentially at a higher risk of getting injury. Uh, so if there is an asymmetry side to side distance of travel in an adult about greater than four centimeters, those are the participants or the patients that we want to keep an eye out or try to look at making that difference lesser than that four centimeter margin, uh, because above that, uh, the risk of injury rises significantly to two, four times. And then from that single leg line, so we are looking at leg length as we define it from the uh, just the leg, right? So we're not talking about the so ASIS to the medial malleolus is what we are looking for. Uh, and if participant cannot reach at least 89.6% of their uh, leg length on that side, they are at a significantly higher risk for injury. Uh, so that's something as a practitioner, we have been able to find out. So this becomes relatively easier as a test in the dance studios that is relatively lower in technology that you might not need a whole lot of equipment to do. Likewise, we have done work with the single leg hop test. And you can see on the right hand side, a participants is trying to do this so again, very simple test, just lay down a tape on the floor to measure how far they go. Again, we did some work with vertical jump and single leg hop and vertical jump is one of the com NFL combined tests that is used, but it does not have the predictability, predictive value to be more precise. Uh, so we can have another conversation about that later. Uh, but from a performing arts dance medicine perspective, what you're finding in the single leg hop test seems to be another test that might be simple to actually implement in a studio setting. Um, less than 78.2 percent of body height seems to be a threshold above which the risk for injury goes down and below which every unit decrease looks like there is a higher 15 to 20 percent at per every percentage point that a participant cannot jump in that forward direction and this again means that they jump and they have to balance on that leg so it's not as far as you can jump and fall like you would do with the olympic uh jump this is a can you stick that landing uh and so this again seems to be a very easy in terms of technical expertise test to do um 
that we are finding that might provide some predictive value for injury. Again, needs to be replicated like all research needs to be replicated in multiple settings and larger settings. But this is something that we are pretty excited to find out. Uh, we did then look at another project where we looked at whether cross training really works for dancers and performing artists. So we did supplemental training uh, or cross training use anonymously, uh, looked at a systematic reviews and we really found that there is some moderate to weak. We did, we did run our quality filters and methodological rigor filters on the articles that we found, but it seems to us that uh, cross training programs that are implemented at least for an hour, at least two to three times a week for at least eight period, eight weeks at a time that include a multi, uh, multi, uh, multiple or multi vary, uh, multivariate activity forms, including some score, some strength, some aerobic and plyometric and other exercises can improve actual aesthetic performance. And when I say aesthetic performance, I want to be very clear with what I say. When I say aesthetic performance and physical performance, the aesthetic performance is performance that is rated from an aesthetics perspective by a judge, right? an external judge, a teacher, a dancer, when you talk about in gymnastics or diving sports, those are the aesthetic component and a physical component. So there are improvements in some physical aspects, again, depending on the type of activity and the type of cross training. And there is a limited evidence that suggests that engaging these type of programs can reduce uh, the risk for back pain uh, in dancers. So again, we, we, we are finding that some of this may be helpful. And then the final piece I'll talk about from this kind of angle is looking at health literacy and what we try to examine from this perspective uh, uh, from a qualitative survey and a quantitative kind of analysis is what is the type of health related education that is provided in programs. And so the, the extrapolation of that could be in athletics programs. What is as a student athlete, the university or the college providing from a health literacy perspective to our participants that they think important, they think valuable, and they think they need. And so what we are finding is that recognition of injuries, basic personal health, nutrition, uh, strength and conditioning, and you can see the, 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 the dip in the things that participants thought was extremely important for them to learn. Um, and so uh, not a whole lot of surprise, but from a performing arts, dance medicine perspective is among the first uh, investigations of what they think is important. And, and from a curriculum perspective on the other end, from a policy making perspective, when you're starting talking about a healthcare perspective, what are the education that we need to design and define for this population to help them stay healthy, become healthy. Now this is a tool that provides us information. Uh, to, to help us design proactively our dance and performing arts medicine curricula. And then finally, when we looked at the qualitative finding, the, some of the barriers that we found for health uh, was that the participants really found that the faculty that they work with, uh, they didn't really have a whole lot of experience or professional training in healthcare. So it's talking about the coaches and the teachers and they didn't really have those qualifications to deliver health related content. And then they had difficulties in obtaining medical care from qualified practitioners. So again, I applaud the performing arts medicine teams, Ken and this group and Raj uh, and their, uh, uh, their work uh, at Hopkins where oftentimes the participants, we found that they didn't feel like they were looked at as quote unquote artists athletes and uh, having people who thought about them as such really allowed them to feel comfortable. Uh, again, the community needs to feel that we provide a service, that we listen to them. And this is something that we found was very interesting. Uh, and the reason for that was we actually talk to them and figure out what they wanted and hopefully have designing uh, proactive uh, uh, infographics and information to to deliver the content that they think is important from a formal and informal perspective. So what are we doing next with this 
line of work, we are again, as I said, looking at some physical work, mental work, we're looking at nutrition, looking at sleep. So all of these projects are in play and hopefully we are gonna continue working on this, getting some data from our collaborators across the nation who are finding similar trend is where we are headed in the near future. And then shifting to the older adult population, not really take a sip. So in the older, older adult population, we are really finding uh, uh, that this can really also help. And so I'll talk about a couple of projects that we have done uh, in the recent past. So the first project I'll talk about is what you call the POIS project. Uh, again, it was a community engaged project uh, funded by uh, uh, the Potomac Health Foundation on Woodbridge, Virginia from the Centera Hospital Group. They were able to help us. Uh, and we collaborated with a local community partner and some other collaborators across uh, different universities. So here's the problem we were talking about from a physical perspective in older adults across the nation, 2.5 million falls annually, three, $34 billion in direct and indirect costs uh, in the state of Virginia. That's where we were looking at. It was about $133 million cost and overall really a, a big, big, big public health issue uh, on an annual basis. And so what we designed was a program similar now, uh, group fitness programs in the community. So we had multiple sites in the community where we did this work that programs were two different. We started with a first program called the Libet Method, which is a dance-based physical activity program that you see at the bottom excuse me and then the other one was uh called the sale program which comes out of uh washington oregon in the uh northwest uh and that's called the safe and active independent living program which was more of an exercise based program and we tested uh, they all have components of strength coordination and balance and we really tested uh multiple things in this program including the balance, reaction times, and acuity, and so on and so forth. And he found that these programs really, really help uh, increase the predisposing factors, the reaction time, they increase strength uh, uh, in our participants. So then we said, okay, let's, that's good. Now let's start to look at what else can we do. And so we worked uh, with our local performing arts center and some colleagues across our university and we were got, we were uh, we were lucky well i shouldn't say lucky we applied and we got uh, some funding from the national endowment for the arts to conduct a randomized clinical trial and uh, we really used dance and music and here again the problem we expanded the scope of this problem so as i said in the adult population also we started with the falls from a physical perspective, but then we added the Alzheimer's because that's again a big problem uh, in the older adult population and the numbers are astronomical in that sense here. Uh, and if COVID has taught us something, it is the, the value of being engaged with each other as humans, as a society. And Vivek Murthy, uh, uh, Surgeon General, that is one of his big uh, uh, areas of interest and uh, uh, focus. And if you haven't read his book, you should read it. It's a fantastic book, um, really from a psychosocial perspective, social isolation and depression and the uh, negative uh, downstream effects of that become very, very significant. Uh, and from an older adult perspective, it's even more problematic because as older adults grow uh, older, well, they lose not only their family structure because their their children and others move away, but they also lose their friends and family as they age and 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 you know uh, move on. Uh, so their circles get smaller and smaller. And so we've tried to figure out what is a way we could again try and bring these community together as much as we could make them just come and talk to each other. So we devised a program, uh, uh, an RCT, where we had older adults and we uh, had three groups, three arms of the project. Uh, the first arm was a dance form, uh, where they again do ballroom dance. The second form was a music form, where they learned how to play the ukulele. Uh, which is some of them may have heard, some of you may have, and it's a smaller version 
of a guitar. It has four strings instead of six strings in a standard guitar. And then we had a, a control arm about a 10 week program. And we again looked at it from a multi uh, faceted perspective. We looked at some physical stuff. We looked at some mental cognition stuff. We did some focus group interviews and surveys. And we did some uh, arts specific surveys and we tested them during, sorry, before, post, and after one month uh, to examine if there was any retention going on. Uh, so again, we used this, we did some clinician based surveys and some participation engaged surveys. Uh, this was free for the participants and they also got some recruitment benefits. They could attend performances at the local uh, performing arts center. Uh, from a physical perspective, we examined their performance using the SPPB, which stands for the short physical performance battery. And you can quickly see the three tests from the balance test, a three minute, three meter gait speed test, and a chair sit to stand test. And again, very, very, very technologically not hard to implement locally able to implement kind of projects and tests. Uh, we saw consistently, as you see from the left hand to the right hand side, there was an improvement uh, in the SPPV scores for the participants uh, from pre to post after intervention. From a cognition perspective, we use the MOCA, which is a full form of, of that is the Montreal cognitive assessment evaluation. And it is a series of questions and writing that the participants have to do with tests, multiple areas of cognition, grow orientation, memory, language, abstraction, attention, uh, writing skills, and so on and so forth. And likewise, we saw there was a, an in, a significant increase uh, post and post two as compared to the pre uh, so what does this tell us? This tell us physically and cognitively this work, right? So uh, we did then some focus group interviews where we then transcribed the data and did a qualitative analysis using thematic induction analyses. And these are the big themes that came up that the participant really felt that they made social connections, they learned new skills, they had a better self sense and a sense of personal growth. And this I think was very important because this was after a long time for a lot of these participants, they actually felt that they learned something new, did something yeah. new, and met someone new. Love you. See you soon. And, and so this was interesting for us to see that that really helped them. And the, some of these groups, they started renting rooms at our local after our intervention was done and stayed engaged with the program. So which is really heartening for us to see. So again, we, we had, we looked at, we, we, we published several pieces from there with motivation, uh, how to engage them, how to retain them. And then, and really our, our, our PSD resistance for this project is, is, is in press, is hopefully coming out sometime in the near future, right? But again, what we are finding is that arts and community engaged programs that are participant empowering, fun and free for them can positively improve their physical and cognitive health. They feel like they're engaging and if we are able to provide these programs that use the participants information and so are able to flex based on their needs, they can retain, which I think is a, is a next step for us as practitioners to figure out how do we retain and adhere, how these people adhere these behaviors. So where are we going next? Like the world, we are moving into the online telehealth, telemedicine perspective, virtual in-person, combinations of interventions. We are starting to look at culturally what's appropriate, age-wise what's appropriate, really can we do something that can be enjoyable and, and improve well-being in these groups. Uh, and uh, I'll quickly then end up with this idea of how we have envisioned and how we envision our research and scholarly enterprise. And we're really talking about research and the papers that come out really at the back end of this process. The research provides data for us to provide information as support for the granting work that we do, which hopefully provides us with the funding. And then that fund provides us a resource to help students get 
work done and provides them with teaching experience, which provides them the service to the community, which again, as a research project, we would engage with the community that provides us the data and this circle goes back. So I think that's how good we are trying to do uh, consistently with several and most of our projects in this area of work uh, to really try to get the community engaged. And that really engenders a bigger picture. So when you talk about research, again, it's not just the lab research from an athletics perspective, from a physical activity artist perspective. Yes, the lab and the clinic work, but they work because they are embedded within the community. And unless we get the community to want to come and we go to the community, uh, it's going to be harder for us to continuously maintain this cycle. So really, what does it really mean? We have to work toward working combined in the lab, in the field perspective, we have to collaborate, we have to communicate, always think about the big picture, teamwork makes a dream work sort of a deal. Um, and I have worked, and hopefully these are some of the people I have aspirations of working with. Uh, Ken and I have talked with Andrea, thank you for inviting me. Uh, talked to Preeti, Dr. Raghavan uh, before, trying to see if we can engage with them. I've had several great conversations with Dean Hoover uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Basti P. Gray, and uh, I, I was looking up and I saw Dr. Imam's uh, uh, profile and, and hopefully can start working in the near future with them. And Dr. Dev is right here and we've had some good conversations and done some work together. And hopefully we'll communicate after this, Raj, and talk about what, what trouble we can come up with in the near future. So uh, nothing happens without a team and I'm really happy and glad to have graduate students. Uh, colleagues that work with me to to do this work and so that's kind of the wrap of my conversation this morning and I am glad to take this time if people have questions I'm going to stop sharing now so thank you thank you very much for that presentation uh you've given us a lot to think about uh, I was interested in the um the monitoring uh, system that you're using. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that and are you using it in other areas as well? Um, can you talk about your deployment for that? Sure, sure, sure. So primarily, so we are using, uh, uh, again, we, are, we have not, we don't have the funding yet to create a whole big database at this point, which is the third party database. But right now what we are doing with our monitoring system is, uh, we are using our healthcare staff, our athletic training staff, uh, and physical therapy staff at our collaborating institutions, and they are the ones primarily looking at the injury exposure data and the injury, uh, uh, basically injury exposure, right? So we work with them, and they work with the faculty at the university and try to figure out how much exposure is occurring. Uh, we obviously, from a, a EMR perspective, there's, there is injury data that we are continuously following. And then we, at the start of the academic year and the end of the academic year, we are trying to institute programs, not programs, assessment screenings to figure out. And over the years, we've, we've done multiple versions of it. And we think we have found a version that works. And when I say it works, uh, and, and Ken, you and I had talked about about 15 years ago about 3D biomechanical work and examining in that, but, and we still do that, but only for select project because that's really not translatable into a dance studio. So we've come up with some measures and I'll be glad to share them with you. Uh, uh, so we are implementing that at the start of the year and that's a physical activity questionnaire. Uh, that's a health related life questionnaire and then their sleep that we measure on a monthly basis. Uh, again, COVID really did a little bit of number on some of this work, but that's fine. We are again up on the saddle as it were. Uh, and we are really trying to then have the data. So we have a common codified structure that we come up at Mason. So all our partners have the same kind of things that they do, but that's not only what they do they are we are welcome for any site who wants to do their thing so i'll give you an example uh, we are partners up at moravian uh, in pennsylvania and they work closely with an audiology unit so they want to also get some music data and like great get that data right no problem uh, we provide a scaffold um, 
fortunately or unfortunately depending on which side you are we have students to work with so <laughs> so there are people there is personnel for uh, uh, us to work with who can chew through some of those data but i think if you come up with some means uh, that can allow a clearer collation of these data points that we are finding make sense as a mass because all of us are doing individual and that's what's missing and so that's how we are doing it and from now a freshman when they enter they get a, and then at the end of their academic career as a senior from a collegiate perspective is what we are looking at so we have now about three cohorts that we've done that bookending to see what the physical activity and and we hopefully have history of what they've done again it takes time and we are only now 2019 was our first group where we actually had those data complete data sets and and then the second data set of 2020 and then we couldn't get another data set 21 for obvious covid based reasons and we are now this year starting to start re-engage with that data set so is that what you were asking primarily ken or is that am i missing the point oh, of the question a little, a little <laughs> bit extra too okay <laughs> No, that's great. great. We have a question in from John Shipley at our Columbia Clinic. Um, you know, what were the barriers and facilitators to your uh, interventions in the schools with youth interventions? So, so I'll, I'll 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 talk about I'll talk about the facilitators first. Then I'll talk about the barriers, and I'll talk about the facilitators again. Right. So the good bad good sandwich. Right. Uh, so uh, the facilitators. It was very interesting. Uh, it was just a simple email, right? So it started with a simple email that I wanted to do something in this group and I just emailed the teachers and you, it, it was really heartening to see uh, that every teacher, PE teacher in this case that I touched base with, they're like, yeah, absolutely, we'd love to do that. And I, I, think, I think the facilitators were the athletics director, the PE uh, instructors themselves. And oftentimes we, we hopefully, uh, we are going to get people who are excited to do this work because they see the bigger picture, right? So talking about the bigger picture, it's not about coming into your class and doing stuff that we want to do. It's about the bigger picture of how it is going to help their kids and what this gives to them. And we were able to, again, fund some equipment for their PE programs because of this work. So bringing them on as a partner. Uh, some of the barriers that we had was the scheduling logistics and the time logistics. Uh, and so, again, with all these programs, they are voluntary programs. So we could not, will not, don't want to force anybody to do that. And so that was an issue for us to get into the schools. And with a bigger school system, bigger, bigger things can happen and bigger structures need to be hurled over right so there was the irb issue that we had to wait about six to eight months um, and have conversations with the with the with the central administration as it were to implement something because we were technically an external party implementing something within the system and so all of the paperwork that we did we had to we had we had to navigate through that so that was a barrier but then finally again i'm going to talk about the facilitators the principals and the assistant principals were really, really, really good advocates for us once they start what start to see what we did. So at the end of the day, it's people, right? At the end of the day, it's people. I think we were coming in as a partner and not as a taker of research data. And that was the big difference from what we did. And it was conversations. I would, I would show up and class would start at 7.15. Uh, we would be there at 7.30 on those days. And just be around uh, uh, them and, and create a relationship before actually looking at the data, right? So the data was latent. That's what we did. And that's hopefully what we do, that you're not going to collect data. And the data is the end result of the work that you're doing. You're actually producing a physical response that is going to help your student, right? That's, that's, that's the way we approach this. Um, because that's what we are doing as healthcare practitioners. We are trying to improve our patients, our clients, health, life, well-being, and the information, the project itself lives or dies because we do that work to help our end user. Uh, the research can come at the back end. If it comes great, if it doesn't, we at least did something that helped them. So that those were something that we found.
Great, thank you. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming on today and remind everybody that next month, Richie Bansells, the former trainer with the Baltimore Orioles, will be our speaker on Tuesday morning, June, I believe it's the 10th as well. Um, and we will regroup then. And everybody have a great day. If I, if I could add just one oh, more go thing. Go ahead, Ken. Real quick. Sorry. <clears throat> I just want to put a plug in for um, an upcoming, this is an inaugural um, event that is a, a joint effort between Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, the School of Medicine, um, as well as Peabody. Um, and this will be our inaugural joint conference on uh, sports medicine, performing arts medicine, and performance science. Um, and this is uh, June 11th from around eight to two o'clock. We're still working on uh, finalizing some of the, the timing, but the title of the event will be Sidelined and Offstage, COVID's Impact on Performance, Training and Health for Artists and perf uh, for Athletes and Performing Artists. Um, and we'll have um, members of Johns Hopkins University Sports Medicine, uh, Rehab, the School of Medicine uh, to talk about how COVID has uh, changed our lives for the better, how we've used and learned from that experience. So uh, we will be sending out to our mailing group um, a, a placeholder in more detail shortly. I also um, can put the registration link in the chat. So if people wanna start to register for it um, or share the link with others that are interested, um, feel free to do so, but we'll get more information out. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrea. Yep. Thank you again, Jatin. I really appreciate it. Uh, this was a great talk, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Likewise. Thank you, everybody. Stay healthy. Bye -bye. Thank you, Jatin. Bye. Bye, Good to see you. Yep. <laughs>